Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Lambing, Kidding and Calving on Pasture. Our panelists today are from the National Center for Appropriate Technology or NCAT. I am Larissa McKenna, I'm FACT's Humane Farming Program Director and I will be moderating today's session. So thanks for joining us everybody. Let me take a minute or two uh, just for a few introductions before we dive right into our session today. Uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust are fact. We are a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Illinois, but we do work across the country. Uh, and what we do is we ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. To do this, we support humane farmers such as yourselves. We also promote policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat. And we also help uh, customers, consumers make informed purchasing choices. So along with my, my colleague, Samantha, uh, I run Fax Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. Um, we offer grants, scholarships, customized materials, mentorship, and of course, uh, lots of webinars on a variety of very fa fascinating topics. So I do want to note that we are currently accepting applications for our Fund to Farmer grants through next Thursday, January 20th. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org forward slash farmer to learn all about these opportunities and our other farmer services. So this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our panel. Uh, with us today, we have Margot Hale, Linda Coffey, Tracy Mama, and Linda Poole, who are all livestock specialists with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCATS. We're really lucky to have them all with us to share their experience and expertise on this topic. And so I'm going to hand it right over to Margot to get us started. Take it thank away. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Larissa. It's really great to be here. Let me get my controls here. All right. So just to give you all just a brief introduction to NCAT and who we are. NCAT is a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to help build resilient communities through local and sustainable solutions. And um, NCAT has a variety of programs and we, we focus mainly on sustainable, sustainable agriculture and sustainable energy programs. Um, many of you may be familiar with ATRA, which is NCAT's long running uh, sustainable agriculture information service. And um, through ATRA, we have hundreds and hundreds of farmer friendly publications, webinars, videos, podcasts, resources, um, a lot of really great information on our website. So I encourage everyone to um, check out the ATRA website if you've never been there before. And uh, we also have technical specialists and um, you're about to hear from four of us. And um, we are available to help answer questions and provide one-on-one um, -on -one assistance. Um, most of our agriculture specialists are also farmers themselves or have been farmers in the past. And so um, not only can we help you with you know, whatever research and technical information you need, but we can also share a lot of our own practical experiences. And you're gonna hear that today throughout this webinar. And um, much of what we're sharing with you or all of what we're sharing with you today is based on our own personal experiences too. And so um, you can call us uh, via 1-800 number, you can email us, uh, you can chat with us on our website, but please utilize the resources at ATRA and our specialists to help you in any of your farming ventures. Um, we have, I know today we're talking about livestock, but we have resources and specialists um, that cover all areas of agriculture from crops and soils, marketing, business planning, really anything you can think of, um, we can help you. All right, so I also wanna tell you about um, a couple of our other programs that really complement ATRA. Uh, one is Arm to Farm, which is a training program for military veterans who are interested in farming. So if any of you on the webinar today are veterans or know a veteran who is interested in farming, please check out Arm to Farm. Uh, we offer a week-long training program for veterans. Um, we also offer other trainings and assistance and um, other opportunities. So you can find that all on armtofarm.org. 
Uh, a new uh, program that we have recently launched is Soil for Water. And um, this program is really utilizing peer-to-peer -peer learning and um, kind of on-farm research and testing to find solutions to um, help our, our pastures and our ranches hold and retain uh, water. And this is to um, you know help mitigate both drought and um, excessive amounts of rain. So um, this is a really exciting program, and we are um, doing lots of um, workshops and training and peer-to-peer -peer networking with farmers and ranchers all over the country. And you'll hear more about this later. And um, a new program for MCAT is our AgriSolar Clearinghouse. And this is kind of taking our um, agriculture side and our energy side and, and finding um, this nice area of overlap. And um, we are helping ag, ag producers, farmers, um, really uh, figure out ways that they can integrate production with um, solar energy. And um, we have a really good forum and some uh, some good information on the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. So if you have any interest in, um, you know, grazing under solar panels or um, growing crops under solar panels, things like that, um, please check out the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. <clears throat> Okay, so just briefly today, um, in just a moment, you're gonna hear a brief introduction from all of us here to give you a little bit of background about ourselves. Uh, we're gonna talk about kind of five key areas that, um, you know, this, this topic of uh, kidding, lambing, calving is so huge. There's no way we can talk about everything involved with this in just an hour and a half. Um, but as we were putting together this presentation, we found that there are five things that all of us do, even though our operations are very different. So we're going to share with you those five keys to success and what that looks like on each of our farms. You know, we all have different operations um, and we manage this system differently, but we do have some commonalities. As Larissa said, we will have a question and answer period at the end. And um, and then um, we will follow up with resources later. So I am Margot Hale, and um, on our farm in Northwest Arkansas, on our farm in Northwest Arkansas, we um, primarily raise Kiko meat goats, and um, we have had boars in the past, and you know a few other a few other breeds, but primarily we have meat, uh, Kikos, and um, we also raise belted Galloway beef cows. And um, I grew up raising dairy cows, actually, and um, we've had <laughs> various other cattle over the years, um, but I've, I've raised a lot of cattle. And I have had Katahdin hair sheep in the past. Um, we don't currently have sheep on our farm, um, but I do have experience with them as well. All right, Linda Poole. Hi, I'm Linda and one of the two Lindas here today. I'm the one from Montana and I've been on cattle ranches all my life, um, raising horses and cattle, but mostly what I'm doing now is sheep. So tried 12 different breeds, doing my own crossbreeding program. Uh, really excited to engage with you all and, and the rest of the team with the rest of the meeting today. So thank you. I'm Tracy Mama, and I'm also in Montana, although I'm in western Montana across the state from Linda, what we call the tropics of Montana. And I, I raise uh, with my family, we have a small diversified livestock farm, and we raise Katahdin hair sheep, which we've been doing for about 15 years. We also have a few um, Aberdeen Angus cattle and just a few goats. And I'm Linda Coffey. I'm in Arkansas, not too far from Margo, much more mild climate where we are. I've been raising sheep pretty much all my life. And I began with Suffolk when I was a young girl. Um, but over the last 20 years, we've been transitioning more to the Gulf Coast sheep. We really like their hardiness. Um, you'll see pictures of them here. Uh, we've raised goats too, a few meat goats. And Alpine and Sauna dairy goats are my love and had them for 20 years. We have a small property. It's 
50 acres, about half of that is grazable. So 45 to 45 to 50 uses is, is pretty pretty much our capacity. And as we said, we want to talk about the five keys to success. And here's what, what we say they are. Nutrition, selecting good animals, providing a safe environment, being well prepared and having a plan, and then observation and intervention only as needed. We know a lot of you came to see a birth and we will get to that, but that is going to be at the end of the rest of this because we feel like these things set you up for success and, and we want you to be educated about those. Right? I'm going to start with nutrition. I very strongly believe that without good nutrition, you will not have a good outcome. It's key for having the strong mothers and the strong babies that get up and look for milk and there are plenty of milk being on hand. Because we're talking ruminants, of course, we want to focus on forage when we're talking about nutrition. Recognizing that at some times of the year and for some classes of the livestock, we need extra energy. We wanna be careful about not too much starch because we're always thinking about the ruminant microorganisms and protecting them. So plenty of forage, not much starch. Water and minerals, that's fundamental. And I believe loose free choice minerals. Intake is key for them to do well. They really have to eat a lot. And we'll talk about that. It's a challenge because animal needs are increasing from maintenance to pregnancy and space becomes an issue. You can see in my picture here, my Alpine dairy goat that year had quintuplets, with, which is extreme, but for our small ruminants, the crowding is real. And, and so also wanted to uh, mention that forage quality changes, so it's a moving target, it's declining with maturity. I want to thank my husband, who's a nutritionist, for this next three graphs. He has presented in a concise way uh, daily intake, that is dry matter, as a percent of body weight, where um, green is for sheep, red is for dairy goats, blue is for meat goats, and then you have maintenance, late gestation, early lactation. It doesn't actually look that impressive that change from maintenance to late gestation, but it is. Uh, it it, it, it demands a better quality of feed and we'll show that too. And especially for dairy animals, that jump from late gestation to early lactation is dramatic. The same trend is true for cattle, although they don't need as good nutrition as the small ruminants uh, uh, as a percent of their body weight. So I ran a few examples. Linda Poole has large sheep, and um, 180 pounds, they'll need 3.24 pounds of feed at maintenance. And in gestation, they need more, they need five. That doesn't seem dramatic, um, but 120 pound dairy goats, like I had at maintenance 2.4, during lactation, they have to eat six. You can see that's a, a very big jump. Maybe you can picture it best with cows. A thousand pound cow eating at 2% body weight and then jumping to 3% body weight, goes from 20 pounds of hay to 30 pounds of hay. That's a significant change. So while the space is being taken up by babies, they need to eat more, quite a bit more. Next. The same trend is true for protein. Next. And for total digestible nutrients, which is another way of saying energy. Next. These next Two graphs came from Greg Braun through the Tennessee Master Meat Goat Producer course. I like how this lays out the nutritional requirements against what you can get off your pasture. So pa vegetative pasture, that is green and growing pasture in the South, is in that left-hand bar. And I, re I told you that it will uh, decline with maturity. So you can see that in the total digestible nutrients available on mature pastures quite a bit less. And on dead pasture, like now, not that much nutrition there. So this graph shows the needs of cows and goats. And you can see that on vegetative pasture, we have enough energy for all of our classes in even a heavy milking cow. Okay, next. And the same trend is true for protein. On vegetative pasture, you can get all the protein that you need for all the classes of livestock. It declines with maturity. And we need to think about that when we're looking at our hay as well. If the hay was put up on vegetative pasture, it's going to be more nutritious than if it was put up with a lot of seed heads in it. Um, the other factor though, remember intake is key, has to be palatable. So not only nutritious, but something that they really will enjoy eating. 
next. And the way we know how we've been doing with our nutrition is body condition. This is something we need to do, whatever our kind of livestock are. It's kind of easy to show with these meat goats. The one on the, on the left is way too fat. And the thing about goats is when they're carrying that much cover on the outside, they have this enormous wad of fat on the inside, wrapped around their organs, taking up more of that precious space. And this puts them at risk. For one thing, it's hard to get them bred when they're too heavy like that. And if you do get them bred, research shows they don't tend to carry twins. They, they carry one, which will grow to be enormous. And that's just a recipe for dystocia or difficult birthing. They also are at risk for metabolic problems like pre pregnancy toxemia. So don't let your animals get this fat. However, the one in the middle is too thin and that's not good either. Uh, this animal will have a hard time getting through the winter, have a hard time fighting off parasites and other health issues. She's likely to have weak babies and poor colostrum and just not do that well. And she's also at risk for metabolic problems. What we want is that proper condition like the animal on the right, moderate to uh, a high moderate condition, and then keep giving her good forages throughout and then she'll have everything going well. I want to say for sheep and goats, this is really important for them to be able to fight off the periparturient rise. That is when they give birth, their immune systems temporarily kind of go offline while the parasites are ramping it up. If we have an animal that's properly conditioned, she's got some ability to fight that off. And so um, body condition is really important. Marta? Great nutrition leads to great outcomes. And I want to stress that we need not just quality, but also quantity. So the picture on the left is a, a dairy goat that's kidding in early spring, and that's super high quality forage, but it's gonna be hard for her to eat six pounds of dry matter on a really short pasture like that. So um, a better situation is in the middle there where there's plenty of quality and quantity, and we just need to respect our soil health principles and our animal health principles, get them off before they graze it too short, let it regrow and fully recover before we put them back. And I wanna thank Dave Scott, who I believe is on this webinar for the picture on the right. I love this way of feeding hay where, where you can give them good quality hay and keep it good quality. They cannot lay on it and give them plenty of quantity. You can see that's loose, that's easy for them to get to. So I appreciate that. Uh, next, you're gonna see some videos from Dave when we send them out tomorrow. If you don't remember anything else I said, this is my take home message. Be sure they can eat all the forage they need. And sometimes the way we feed it, we restrict them. So the first picture is our hay feeder, which is simply a cattle panel wrapped around a big bale. They can eat in and they do, as you can see, until they can't reach anymore. So one of my favorite jobs is to go pull that hay down and make sure that all the spaces are filled so that everybody can get around like you see in the middle and eat all the hay they want. Another thing I would say is if you reach into your hay feeder with your hand and pull really hard and you can't get very much hay out, think what your animals are having to do with their mouth. And so help them out, especially in Arkansas when we get ice and I imagine and it's true for all of you. Sometimes it's a lot better idea to waste a little bit of hay, roll it out on the ground so they can get all they need. Um, the picture here on the right, it was 18 degrees that day. I really feel good seeing that all my animals can eat and can eat all they want. If you're feeding any energy, again, watch, watch, watch. Make sure that nobody's getting too much and um, watch those lamb races happening while you feed the mamas. And the best way to give them all the forage they need is that green growing pasture. So if your system allows you to, to lamb on forages like that, I, I know you'll do well. This is so important. I encourage you to get some help with this. Our cooperative extension service has a, a probe that we use to sample our hay to get it analyzed. And this is key information. So you know whether you need to supplement or you don't. Working with nutritionists, as Linda Poole has done, can save you a lot of money, so I encourage that. My husband, the nutritionist, recommends the Maryland Sheep and Goat Ration Balancing Program, so good luck. I do say this is a very key point. Good luck with that. Thanks. And I'm going to follow up on, on Linda's really great uh, lead-in on prior proper 
preparation for your lambing, calving, and kidding season. And, you know, the, the foundation that we have with good pasture management and good nutrition, all of that and the other four principles play out upon the palate, which is the breeding livestock that you have. So the choice of animals that you are breeding is going to be another really big determinant in how much fun you have during birthing season. And uh, I think that when it comes to selecting breeding livestock, there's always this question of, am I going to get what I'm paying for? You know, I paid a lot of money for this animal. Am I going to get what I paid for? And who knows? That, that depends. But there is one thing you can count on, and that's what Thelma and Louise say. And that's that you will get what you settle for. A lot of having a really good breeding herd is not so much what you buy, but what you cull what you continue to keep and breed. Next slide, please. So uh, the Soil for Water uh, forum that we have that Margot mentioned in the beginning is this really great place to exchange information. It's just getting started. But I, in preparation for this, I put a note up there and I asked people, you know, what, what do you think about lambing, calving, and kidding? And Dr. David Fernandez of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff responded, and I thought his, I thought his response was just genius. I'll read it here. Uh, my top concern for any pasture-based system is ease of calving, kidding, and lambing, especially that they twin easily for small ruminants. When animals are dispersed and unlikely to receive assistance with a difficult birth, they need to be able to calve lamb or kid easily. My other top pick is that the animals be appropriately sized to the available forage. Larger animals often cannot meet their nutritional needs on pasture alone, and you cannot raise as many pounds per acre as you might wish because of their nutritional needs for maintenance. And that keys back to what uh, Linda Coffey was just saying about the condition of your pastures and, and you know, having that interrelate with the, uh, with the livestock that you have. So let's go to the next slide, please. And let's look at a process if you are first choosing animals. And I think about it first as choose a breed, then choose a breeder, then choose the animals, then observe and choose what it is that you're gonna keep because what you keep this year determines what you're gonna get next year too. And I love these pictures. I wanna thank uh, Weaver Ranch for allowing us to use the picture of the Mashona bull in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, when we are talking about pasture-based systems, that's a high forage type of a diet. And you need a really big, very functional rumen to make the thing work. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at, at sheep or goats or cattle. Um, when you're thinking about the breed, when you're thinking about the animal itself, look for that nice big gut on them is a really good place to start. Another thing that I, that I wanted to have us think about is adapting the animals that you choose for your particular environment. All three of the breeds shown here are very well adapted to very different environments. The Scottish Highlanders are not going to be what they want to have in New Mexico. The Black Angus cattle, um, even though they're very popular in a lot of places, if you look at this particular bull, he looks a lot different than most of the other Black Angus bulls that at least that we see in Montana. He's, he's a, uh, got a moderate frame, he's got a big gut, he is set to succeed in a uh, grass-fed type of a situation. So let's go to the next one, please, Margo. So when you're thinking about what breed is actually best, start with your land and start with your management. Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it dry? Those things. What do you have for shelter? What do you have for fences? We're going to talk about that a little later in terms of lambing. Also think about where, what your markets might be. So these things all make sense when you're choosing, when you're choosing a breed, but I also want you to consider whether you want to choose a breed or whether you might want to think about crossbreeding. And the reason for that is that with crossbreeding, you get something called hybrid vigor or heterosis. And for the same amount of inputs, that 
genetic diversity can sometimes allow you to have at least 150%. So, you know, half again as much production for the same stuff that you're putting in simply because you've got good genetic diversity in your herds and your flocks. Next, please. So when it comes to moving from the idea of I'm going to choose a breed, you settle on that. And then I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of choosing the source of your livestock, because that's another thing that is going to, you're going to get what you settle for. And if you go to the feed feed lot, or if you go to the auction barn and you buy breeding stock, prepare for disaster. Um, <laughs> just, it might be good, but most of the time it's not. And you might be able to buy perfectly healthy animals, but like here in our, in our stockyards in Billings, Montana, it's full of cattle one week and it's full of sheep and goats and llamas and pigs and everything the next week. And you don't know what you're bringing home. Um, likewise, it's really easy to go on the internet and think I'm going to buy top quality stuff. So I'm going to look at show quality animals. And if you look at the, um, it is a heifer, although it's kind of hard to tell in the lower left-hand corner, that's one of the highest selling heifers in the UK a few years ago. And uh, I can tell you <laughs> that this is not going to work. If what you want to do is raise race cattle that you could jump on and run across the, the, the prairie with, you could do that, but she does not have the build that's going to allow her to uh, succeed in a grass-fed system. And so my idea is the number one way to choose a breeder is find someone with a place and practices that are similar to you, the pre people who are experienced, that have an excellent health program, and that will guarantee the livestock that they get to you. In the best case scenarios, you'll be able to do like I do with my cattle. This is the Barthelmus Ranch in the top uh, right-hand corner. And when I want to buy some cattle, I can go right there and, you know, I've got all the help I need. And that is not to be underrated. Next, please. When it comes down to thinking about the, the breeding stock itself, I'll bet you can look at these three pictures and know that these are not animals that I am <laughs> recommending under any case. Uh, and you can probably guess why with each of them. Uh, imagine uh, pulling the calf out of a bull that's muscled like this. Um, you know, that is going to be difficult. The show lambs, um, I, I saw somebody write on in the chat that they had a, a bad experience with suffix. Uh, I'm not going to down downplay the breed, but what I will say is when you're buying show stock and they have had their tail docks so short like this, that you better know how to deal with prolapses because they are likely. Um, so really what it boils down to when you're choosing a particular animal, you can choose them based on paper. You can do some work on that. And with cattle and sheep, I don't know about goats, but we have things called expected breeding values, EBVs, or expected progeny differences, EPDs. And some of the top breeders will record what, what type of offspring you can expect from these, from these bulls or these rams. Um, based on, on some mathematical tracking of related animals. And that can be really helpful. And if you're looking at that, I would encourage you to do the same thing with numbers that you'll do when you're looking at your animals. And that is go for moderation. If you are doing pasture-based systems, easy does it. Don't go for the really high performance. Don't go for the super milkers. Um, they need super nutrition. Um, they need super care. So be, be very careful about that. When you're, when you're out and you're looking at a breeder's animals out in the field, I talked to Alejandro Carrillo with uh, Understanding Ag. Little plug here, you'll get to hear him as one of our keynote speakers if you come to our Soil Health Innovations Conference in March. And he's fantastic because he really brings together regenerative care of the land with choosing livestock. And he said, look at their hair coats and look at their body condition scores and, and look to see which ones look calm and settled. And sometimes that's all you need um, to start with. I would say in addition to that, that, you know, go back to those nice big, well, this is the cowgirl way of saying it. When I'm looking at animals out in the field, um, I look at 
guts, nuts, and butts. You know, I want I want that big rumen to be able to handle the forage. I want ewes to have a nice a nice roomy pelvis for that easy lambing that and calving that Dr. Fernandez talked about. And with the males, um, in this case, size really does matter. Uh, you want a big scrotum with nice even testicles. And uh, that is going to be one of the main determinants to tell you how many females that that, that that male can cover. So it's easy to remember just nuts, butts, guts, go out and have a look at that. Um, the other thing that is easy to, to um, get lost on is the idea that I, these animals are so precious to me that if, if they have a, a, a little bit of a bad year, Oh, they don't breed or, or they lay on their lamb. I'm going to give them a second chance. Back to Thelma and Louise, you will get what you settled for. If they lay on their lamb this year, they might lay on their lamb next year. Um, save yourself a lot of headache, cull them. Um, and the other piece that goes with this is take really good notes through the year. How did that female take care? How did she, how did she birth? Was she a good mother? Is she nice and calm? Is she um, looking out for youngsters on pasture? So keeping all that information in mind should help you be able to have the, the right animals that can perform in your pasture-based system, so long as you keep your eye on those other four principles too. And uh, we'll pass it off now. Thanks, Linda. And you're absolutely right. Um, observing and taking those good notes all year long um, is, is going to serve you really well when we're talking about birthing. And, you know, one of the key factors that we all kind of agreed on is really this preparation um, can make or break your kidding, calving, lambing season. And, you know, preparation really does happen all year long. And I, I want to start out by mentioning farm goals and um, how important it is to have farm goals and how these goals are going to dictate how you manage the system on your farm. Um, your livestock enterprises, the marketing, um, many other decisions that you make are going to be determined by your farm goals and the values and priorities that you have on your farm. Every farm is different and has different goals and should have different goals. Um, and so there are going to be different systems of managing. And here in a little while, we all are gonna share how we kind of manage birthing on our own farms. And you're gonna hear, we have very different systems. And so we make different decisions and um, based on those goals and those systems. And, um, you know, so there's just lots of things. Uh, I know people want one simple, good, easy answer of what they should do or what it should look like on their farm. And unfortunately, we're, we don't have um, one, one single answer and we wouldn't ever give it to you anyways. We'd always say it depends and it really does. Um, but understanding your, your goals, your markets, uh, your environment, and uh, the different priorities you have on your farm are going to help you as you prepare and as you manage your animals through, um, through the birthing season. Um, as Linda said, record keeping is a really important thing. Um, it's important for any farm enterprise, but since we're talking today about uh, birthing, we're gonna relate it to that. Having good records um, helps us make those production decisions. Like Linda said, um, as livestock owners, um, many of us, all of us probably, you, you really do get attached to certain animals and um, it's harder to, <laughs> to be objective. And so if we have good records, we can say, you know what, she didn't breed last year or she didn't wean her animals or, you know, she had health problems, whatever it may be. And um, making those production systems, so culling those animals and not using them for breeding so that we can um, have a better chance at successful um, birthing season and just stronger herds and flocks overall. Um, you know, keeping, keeping those records of, you know, of um, how many babies they successfully weaned, if they had any troubles, um, all of those are really important details to keep records on throughout the year and be able to use that information as you're preparing for breeding season um, and preparing um, to, to welcome new animals to your farm. So I know in the questions that were 
submitted ahead of time, there were several questions about when is the best time to kid, lamb, calve, and is it okay to leave um, a buck, bull, or ram in all the time, or, you know, how, how do we handle that? And um, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so when you choose to have animals born on your farm really depends on your markets. It depends on your weather, your forages, and many other factors. I mean, sometimes you need to plan birthing season based around, um, you know, personal, uh, personal things going on with you or your farm or your family. So you have to decide the timing that works for you and what's best for your farm and your markets. Um, some do choose to leave breeding animals together all year long and have births happening all year long. And sometimes that's great. So you can market meat uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, you don't have one onslaught of, of birthing time, which those of us, you know, who know it, it can be really intense um, if everybody is kidding or calving all at the same time. Um, but Others, you know, want to have a very specific birthing time. And so you um, really have to manage your breeding and, you know, don't have your animals together all the time. So really it's dependent on what works for you and for your system. Um, obviously, when we are talking about when animals are bred and, and preparation, we need to keep those records um, so we know when animals were bred and so when we can expect to have animals on the ground. Um, because there are a lot of things we need to prepare or be ready for um, as we approach that, that birthing time. And so knowing when to expect that is really important. Um, Linda already talked about the importance of nutrition, but really that is part of preparation and it happens all year long. So making sure our animals are on a good plane of nutrition as they head into late gest gestation and birthing is really important. Um, you know, do you have high quality forage or hay? Do you have supplemental feeds on hand? All of that, you know, we need to be prepared to keep our animals in, in good nutrition. Um, it's really important to talk to your veterinarian um, and also, you know, your local extension about vaccinations that are recommended. Um, there are some vaccinations that are given to females prior to birth so that they are passing on immunity. Um, there are vaccinations to prevent um, breeding diseases and um, pregnancy diseases. So um, it's really important to check with your veterinarian on um, diseases that are present in your area and any regulations regarding vaccinations. Um, and, and that is part of preparation. Um, you know, if you need to give a, a vaccination six weeks before kidding, well, one, you need to know when your animals got bred. So you, so you know when it's six weeks before kidding. Um, so you can be able to give those vaccinations at the right time. Um, as Linda Coffey mentioned, uh, sheep and goats, that periparturant rise of internal parasites is definitely something to be aware of and to prepare for, um, making sure you're observing your animals and, um, and managing for those internal parasites. And um, we at ATRA have so many resources related to managing internal parasites for sheep and goats. And so you can um, find those resources on the ATRA website to, to help manage internal parasites. And there are other um, healthcare items that you need to, uh, to do before, before birth as well. You know, with our goats, we, um, we check for parasites with Famacha. We do hoof trimming, make sure everybody um, is in good shape there. Um, sheep, um, some producers crutch their sheep or do some shearing, uh, a little bit of shearing um, to prepare for lambing. So there are lots of things to think about just getting ready to, to to birth, um, anyone who has children, you know that kind of nesting you do before you have have a kid, have a baby. It's the same preparation uh, needs to happen for for our livestock as well. Um, and no matter what we do to prepare and plan, um, we we have to plan that things are sometimes going to go wrong um, because you know things just happen. The weather changes. Um, we end up with. Maybe our forages weren't as good as we we thought or hoped, and you know we need to feed a little bit more supplemental feed. Um, our animals have problems at birth, or our 
our young animals are having issues um, right after being born. So all of these things happen. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later um, when we, we talk about our observation and intervention, but um, it's really important to um, have a plan. So have supplies on hand so that if you do have to intervene with a birth or have a medical issue, um, you have the supplies, you have your, your veterinarian's number or your mentor's number. Um, and be ready to shift from your normal plan. Uh, typically, here in Arkansas, we kid and calve out on pasture, don't even worry about it, you know, usually in January or February. Last year when we were kidding, uh, we had record low temperatures in Arkansas. We had snow on the ground and it was negative 20 degrees, actual temperature. Um, We've never brought our goats into the barn, but I did because it was negative 20 degrees and we had goats being born. And so um, we shifted from our normal plan and, and had supplemental heat available and made sure, um, you know, a system where we normally are outside on pasture. It just it wasn't possible then. So um, to keep everybody safe and healthy, we brought them in. So um, do lots of planning and have those contingency plans of what you might do if if things don't go as planned. Another part of preparation is really preparing a safe environment. And um, this means uh, providing adequate space. Um, when animals are being born, if the animals are you know, crammed together, there's uh, just chances of mismothering or um, animals being nosy and breaking that, that uh, mother baby bond. <laughs> the picture in the, in the top middle, um, it's some of our goats from last year and that's like, you know, grandmother, mother and baby and that, you know, <laughs> that older doe, she was right there all up, all up in the business of her, of her daughter. So um, you have to, you know, pay attention to things like that. And um, if you have shelter, um, making sure that it's, it's clean and accessible, if that's something you are making available to your animals. Um, you know, making sure the area is as clear of hazards. Um, you know, a couple of times we, we've lost young stock just because of like freak accidents of um, young animals getting through a gate or under, you know, through a panel or something um, and they're not able to get back through. Or um, the, the picture on the, on the right hand side with the blue feed tub that's overturned. Um, we're really fancy on our farm and we use lots of um, 55 gallon drums cut in half for, for feed and things like that. Um, and we've found that sometimes young kids will hop in those tubs and flip them over on themselves. And then they, they're not strong enough or big enough to flip it back. So thankfully we've never lost any that way, but we've definitely had to rescue some, some babies from underneath those tubs. So um, just things like that. Um, look around your pastures, wherever it may be that you're, you're kidding or lambing, especially the, the smaller animals and, and make sure that um, it's clear of any, any hazards. Um, for our sheep and goat producers, especially that have livestock guardian animals, this is something to really pay attention to. Um, the interference by livestock guardian animals is real and it definitely happens. Um, definitely, if you have young dogs, I would separate them. Um, they just can't be trusted in, in that situation. Um, and, you know, we've heard of llamas and donkeys also interfering in bursts and, you know, they think they're protecting, protecting the animals, but oftentimes they are, um, you know, preventing a, a young animal from nursing or, um, you know, causing harm in some other way. So be, be aware of that. And then um, also protecting your animals, the young as they're um, being born from predators. So this is kind of knowing your farm and knowing areas that might be um, more at risk. Um, I know personally, when we know we're about to kid, we, we bring our goats to a, a pasture closer um, so we can um, check on them and observe them um, that has good fencing. Um, also on our farm where we have cattle and goats, uh, we do separate the cattle from the goats um, at, at time of kidding, um, just because the cows are big and the baby goats are tiny. Um, and so I'm making sure we're just doing everything we can to protect the young stock as they're right as they're um, getting their start in life. All right, Tracy.
we talked a little bit about observing your animals to see how they're how they're doing during the course of the year. And it's important to keep a record all year long of, of how your animals perform, but it's particularly appropriate uh, at the birthing time. And that will involve uh, different levels of observation depending on the scale of your operation. If you have one animal, you're able to observe them really well and see exactly what they're eating and how they're doing and, and how their health differs from day to day. But if you have 300 animals, you're not able to observe each one individually as closely. But there are still a few cues that you can look at to see how animals are doing. You can look at your entire herd and you can, you can kind of tell how an animal is doing, if it's eating with everyone else, if it's sticking with the herd or flock, if it's off by itself, if it has a shaggy coat, if it's, it's losing some hair, if it's low energy, you may, be, um, you may be headed for problems. And so those are the animals where you wanna intervene, you wanna, you wanna change their nutrition, you wanna make sure that they're healthy ahead of time. And then you want to be observing your animals for signs of impending birth so that you know when, when they're about to, to, uh, to have a baby and, and you, you can uh, adjust appropriately, adjust their food, get them into, as Marco said, an appropriate field, um, an appropriate shelter. Um, you want to keep observing them during birth. You want to make sure the labor is progressing and that they haven't stalled out and that they aren't in need of, of aid from you. Um, it's, it's important to make sure that that, that that process does move right along. And then once the, once the baby's on the ground, you need to keep watching them. You need to make sure that, that it bonds successfully with the mother, that it's latching on and getting milk, that, it, that it's doing okay in the weather, and that, uh, that the offspring continue to thrive over the next few days and weeks, that they're getting enough milk, that they're keeping up with their mother, that they're not separated, uh, that they're not endangered. Uh, and then you want to keep records of your observations from year to year, as, as Linda Poole talked about earlier. You want to look for those animals that are being successful, that are having successful children and raising them successfully, and those are the ones that you're wanting to keep. And that's the, the line that you're wanting to keep in your, in your flock or herd, because that's going to make your life oh so much easier. Okay, Margo, next. So... <laughs> Finally, we're at the, the period of birth, what we've all been waiting for. So some of the things that you can look for um, to, to show that the birth is impending is that the, the baby drops within, within the mother and you'll see the, the shape of the mother change as, as the birth comes nearer, that they'll get a hollow up around their hips and, and you know that then, that then it's coming along. Um, animals do bag up. You'll see their bag increase in size before it's time for the birth, but frequently that'll happen several days ahead of time. So don't think that just because your animal is starting to bag up and looking like they're gonna have a baby soon, you may be out there waiting for a really long time <laughs> if you're depending on that. So, but it is a clue that, that is coming along and that you might wanna get ready with your plans and prepare that space and prepare your contingency plan and have your materials all ready because it's, it's coming soon. Um, the next thing you'll look for is swelling of the vulva area, and that'll show that, that the birth is going to come along in the next couple of days, usually. Your, your impending mother will behave differently sometimes. They'll be off by themselves. They'll be not, um, not showing up for feeding time. They'll be off on their own. Um, they may be particularly aggressive to their, their friends and neighbors at this point. Then when you see the water bag come out, that's your sign that the birth is really starting and you need to be really observing at that point and make sure that it progresses. You'll see the animal labor um, and that may involve a lot of walking around. Um, it may involve intermittent labor. They may get up and get down several times and it may take, it may take a while. Finally, your sign that it's really imminent is that the feet and nose are presenting. And that, that is what you want in the ideal world is the feet and nose. Sometimes you get just a foot or just a nose or just the back feet. And that's not as ideal, but, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's what you're looking for in, in the best of worlds. Next, please. So you might notice that these pictures of birthing on pasture are really birthing in a barn. <laughs> and, and I did wanna mention why that would be because you don't want to be standing this close to your animal in a pasture situation um, while they're in process because they will get up and walk away no matter what point you're at in the process. And that can be a problem. You can break the bond if you, if you approach too closely during the process. 
um, the, they may take off with the baby half out and it, it is not a good situation. So um, don't, don't approach this close if, if they're out on the pasture. Um, so what you're looking in the ideal situation is uh, nose and feet presenting, and then you're gonna see the, the baby coming on out. Um, go ahead, Margo. So at this point, or the, maybe the previous point, um, often an animal will get up and, and stand up and the baby will slip out to the ground at that point. I don't know why this animal's not getting up at this point, but um, it's, it's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> They're not gonna crash into the ground and have difficulties. They're, they're built for that and that will, uh, that will go ahead and get it out. Um, we can go on to the next slide. You're wanting to see the, the mother turning around and paying attention to the baby. You're wanting to see them start licking off the, the, um, the nose, the nostrils to make sure that they're out of the birth sac and they can breathe. Sometimes the next baby will come along really quickly. Sometimes there's a gap, a big gap of half an hour or so before the next one comes along. So you wanna see, um, you wanna see the mother turning around and cleaning up their, their baby and um, paying attention to it. But if another one is coming along quickly, they may not immediately pay attention to the first one. That doesn't mean they forgot it, um, but you do wanna keep an eye on that and do that observation and make sure that they do come back and, and clean it up and bond with the first one. Occasionally there's a problem where the mother will have one and stand up and have a difficult labor and walk quite a distance from the first one um, before having the second one. And so at that point, you wanna make sure that they get back together. Um, that is a, a hazard of, of being on pasture is that they have a little too much space when they have adequate space. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So here, the first one, you see the first baby sitting up and doing well, the second coming out and, um, and we can go on to the next slide. That's just a happy presentation and a successful birth. And you wanna see the mother at this point turning around um, and bonding with those babies, um, acknowledging that they're there, cleaning them up a little bit, make sure they can breathe. You wanna keep watching them and make sure that they are moving and, and getting up and making an effort. Okay, next slide. So this mom has done a great job. She's got her children here. She's paying attention to them. She's cleaning them up. Um, that's a totally successful, happy story at this point. Go on to the next slide. He's really doing a good job paying attention to them, cleaning them up. Next slide. Meanwhile, in another corner of the barn, someone else has been having a family. So this again underscores the point that if you're putting in, if you're putting in your breeding animal at uh, one point and aiming for a, for a set breeding season, you can, uh, expect that you're going to be getting a lot of babies at once. And so there can be a lot going on and you need to be paying attention to that. Particularly, this can be a problem in the adequate space uh, scenario, because if you get babies mixed up, it can be an, a headache for everyone concerned, for the mothers as well as, as the babies. Um, so just a lot, a lot happening. Okay. Sometimes things don't go as well and you need to step in and intervene. There are some reasons why you would intervene with, with what the mother is doing. You'd step out there and intervene in the birth. And that would be um, dystocia, a difficult presentation. Um, also for a mispresentation where uh, it's a breech birth or you have babies tangled together and, and not coming out right. And so at that point, you need to think about intervening. Um, another reason to intervene would be here in this picture, a failure to clear the nostrils. So you would want to get the birth sac off and make sure that they are breathing. Um, if, if they are mismothering, if, they are, if they've become separated or lost or someone has stolen their babies, you may want to go out there and correct that situation and, uh, and intervene in that. Another reason to intervene might be maternal aggression. Occasionally you have a mother that um, turns around and goes after her baby aggressively. And in, in that case, you, you wanna intervene if you're gonna save the baby. 
um, and you want to call that mom because she's not going to be a great prospect for you in the future. Um, and also indifference. Now, I mean, occasionally you have one that walks away and, and doesn't bond well, and that again is a, is a cull situation for you. Although I have to say that if it's a first year mother, sometimes they are really shocked and surprised and it takes them a little while to get used to the idea of being a parent. Um, and, and they may do super in future years. So my, my personal advice is don't be too hard on a first time mom unless she's showing that maternal aggression and she's really going after the baby, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna wanna keep her. But if it just takes her a while to get used to the idea, um, then, then that may be okay. And do keep really good records of this, write it down. You won't remember next year who was a, who was a good mom and who wasn't probably. Um, so keep your records and make your call decisions. We actually go out there and if we know we were gonna call someone, we'll put a tag, a red tag in their off ear to remind us, hey, this, this one's going down the road. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So, if you do need to get out there and intervene, uh, you have a decision to make uh, as to when you're going to do that. You want to think about how the birth is progressing and at what point you're going to go out there. And <laughs> I can tell you, it doesn't get any easier. After 15 years, I still agonize. Is it time to go out? Is it not time to go out? So um, Linda Coffey has a rule of time. She gives it an hour. Um, Linda Poole looks at how the, the animal is doing and has some other indicators of whether they're needing help or not with their, their presentation. So you, you do want to keep watching. And if, if the labor is not progressing, if the animal is laboring hard and nothing is happening, then you're going to need to probably go out there and intervene at that point. Um, the box over here on the side, be sure to keep yourself safe. You have to, you have to think about how you're going to capture the animal how you're going to restrain the animal, um, what you're, what you're going to do uh, at that point when you go in to intervene. You need to be clean. You need to have um, lube and gloves. You need to be gentle because um, particularly with a small ruminant, they are small. <laughs> you need to be aware to take care of yourself and not expose yourself to zoonotic diseases that the animal may have. And that may be a complicating factor in the birth and that might be why it's going, going poorly. Also, you don't want to rush out there too soon and intervene because really the process goes so much better if they're able to take care of it on their own. So if, if it is progressing, don't step out there and intervene. Let them take care of it. Don't crowd in and take pictures. Don't, don't pick up the baby to see what gender it is. Um, don't get in there too soon. Okay, Margo, next. If you are going to intervene, you're going to need lube. You're going to need gloves. You um, should have clean towels to clean up the baby to help dry it off so that it's not getting chilled. Um, you'll need a way to restrain the mother so that she doesn't run off from you as you're trying to be helpful because sometimes the animals mistake our intentions of helping them for uh, a huge predator is coming after me. And then finally, know when and who to ask for help. Um, you have to make a decision about what, at what point you call a vet, at what point you call your neighbor or mentor or friend to help you out. Um, have a plan in, a, a, in advance, have a plan ahead of time and know who you're gonna call and when and what's gonna trigger that, that next phase of asking for help. At the same time, when you, when you are gonna intervene, you have to make a decision about what, at what point intervention is economically uh, feasible and what it's not. Um, frequently, a vet call for a small ruminant is going to be more than the value of the animal. So don't be hasty to call to call a vet. Um, know what you can handle, what situation you can handle on your own, and learn. Um, take some time. Go out with a mentor. Uh, watch some birds on someone else's farm. Learn as much as you can ahead of time to do as much as you can yourself. Okay, Margo, next. Okay, so after the lamb arrives, there are some things that you do for routine hand handling. Um, you can dip the navel in iodine to help to help prevent infection, um, to to keep it cleaning, healing healthily. Um, docking tails is one thing uh, 
which you do not with hair sheep, which I have, but uh, other breeds of sheep require docking and castration, um, identification marking of the baby and vaccination. So those are all reasons that you would need to handle the baby. And that is understood that that's important and necessary. And you wanna make it as um, non-disruptive as possible because you wanna recognize that anytime you intervene, it can disrupt that maternal bond. So it's good to let them have a little bonding time together and get that bond established. The first half hour after birth is when they learn to recognize their mother's call and they learn to recognize each other. It's good to let them have that time together um, and, then, and then progress on into your handling. You, you may need to intervene sooner than that if the baby gets separated, like I mentioned earlier, if they have twins and they're far apart, or if, uh, if they have triplets and they're really scattered out, you may need to put them back together. If the weather is dismal and the baby is getting chilled while the mom is having its, her, next, her next one, you may need to intervene there. Um, hypothermia can be a real problem if you're <laughs> happening to be lambing or calving or kidding in snow. Um, or in a, in a cold rain. You may need to intervene if the baby is weak. Occasionally you have uh, a baby that can't stand up, can't, can't get up and nurse um, because there were uh, too many multiples. Um, often if you have triplets, one of the triplets will be a little weaker than the others and not get right up and stand up. And so you need, then, you'll, then you'll need to think about intervening at that point. On down the road, the next few days, you want to make sure that they're all getting enough milk, especially if you have multiple births, you want to make sure that the mom has enough milk for everyone and that they're all, they're all getting filled. Um, you also want to intervene if you see that the baby is sick or has a, a you know, physical deformity of some sort, you may need to step in and intervene at that point. And so those are all points where you want to go in and intervene with the baby. Next, please. So if you're going to do an intervention, there are a few things that you need with the lamb. One is a jug, a way to restrain the animal and keep track of it so you can keep treating it. Um, you, if you're bringing in a cold baby, you definitely want a heat source. You can see that here I am with uh, lambs in my kitchen. That's what usually happens if they're born in the snow and we've had as many as uh, seven in the kitchen at one time because we had a terrible snowstorm. And, uh, so you want to heat them up, whether it's bring them in the house. Um, sometimes we give them a hot water bottle to heat them up. Um, Margo has a great slide here with some heat lamps on them that um, they're, they're, you need to think about keeping their body heat up, especially if they're not with their mother. If they're with their mother and they're getting milk, it is like magic. You know, If they're getting enough milk into them, it will keep them warm, even if the weather is terrible. But if they're low on milk, you're in trouble and you need to think about heating them up and getting, getting milk into them. Uh, immediately, you need to get colostrum in, whether that's colostrum that you're uh, getting from another sheep or another, I guess, not exclusively sheep, goats, <laughs> another mother, or whether you're using a colostrum substitute, uh, a dry, dry and reconstituted colostrum, um, which is what I, I like to use. You can also freeze colostrum and keep it in the freezer from um, one animal and use it on, a, on another if you need to. In the next few days, if, you're, if you recognize that the baby isn't gonna, gonna need more intervention and continued intervention, sometimes you can just warm them up, get some colostrum in them and get them back out and they'll be fine if they if they're, uh, mother has another baby and you can, you can get them back, back together um, and things will be fine. Sometimes you look at a longer term intervention and they become a bottle baby. In that case, you'll need milk or milk replacer. Uh, you'll need to follow a, a pretty good feeding schedule and get them fed regularly and, and keep it going in. Sometimes you have uh, an animal that will, will not take milk will not suck for whatever reason. And then you need to look at stomach tubing it. Uh, there are many good videos. I'm not gonna go into that here, but there are many good videos on how to stomach tube an animal. I really like to get to them intervened before that point and, and get them just sucking on a nipple, um, get them some colostrum in, and then usually they do well. Um, there are several different options for nipples and bottles. I like to use when they're young, a Pritchard teat, which is a very small one. And um, then maybe shifting on after they're a week or so old to a, a, bigger, a bigger rubber nipple and uh, bottle. 
I'm happy to provide more details on this. We don't really have time to go into it in great detail today, but that's the, the brief overview. Next, Margo. Sorry about that. I was answering a question or trying to. Let's just uh, thank you all for those great presentations. And I hope everybody understands now that there's a whole lot that goes into a good lambing season. As you go into yours, I um, encourage you to pay attention and see what is working well on your farm and then what didn't. And think about how you could make it better next year. In other words, what was the weakest link? Just like Margo explained on her place for me, uh, a safe environment sometimes is the problem. Accidents happen. Um, pay attention to what it is for you. And I encourage you to continue your learning. It's great that you showed up today for a webinar. We've said it several times, mentors are key because getting that hands-on, in-person, uh, real-world experience is super helpful. There's somebody that you can call to say, is it time to call the vet or not? NCAT is here for you. We've got some wonderful videos and things coming to you tomorrow, including from Dave Scott and from Linda Poole. And um, continue to look for more education as you can. Margo? We're gonna conclude this session. Thank you all for staying on with talking about how we handle lambing on our farm. So just briefly, this is my place. Remember, it's a small farm. I've got this one barn. It's very flexible inside. We have two permanent lambing pens, but we can set up more as needed. I like to not bring them in. I really like for them to, to lamb on pasture. I feel like it's cleaner. I can go out there with the taggers and the, cast, and the lastrator and take care of business out there and leave them alone if they're well bonded and they're doing well. But sometimes uh, we have to move them in and that cold rain mentioned earlier and, and bitter wind, those are reasons. If they get too cold, they can't nurse and they can't thrive. Um, moving counterclockwise, I've got a picture here of my sheep strip grazing stockpiled fescue, just to say we use the fescue on our farm and you may on yours too, but encourage you to get off of toxic fescue a week before lambing because it impedes milk letdown, uh, which obviously is not good. Next slide down is again, sheep around the hay bale, give them all they can eat. Do not restrict them on their hay. When you move a lamb into the barn, it's easy to get the mama just to follow. We walk in. Um, if one doesn't, we, we want, like to make a note of that too, but Tracy's absolutely right. Sometimes the beginners, they're just really confused. Um, so try to be patient. If you can be as close to them as, as my husband is here, so they can smell, that really helps in moving them in if you need to. The next picture is uh, July lambs. On my farm, we have a year round market from ethnic customers. So we leave the ram in year round and most of our ewes will lamb twice a year. The Gulf Coast sheep are, are um, prolific, but not in the way that somebody else's sheep are. They don't tend to have more than twins, which is good because they don't have a huge amount of milk. And often they'll have a single and six months later have another single. So that's a, a quirk of our place. I, again, love when they are lambing on pasture. I think that's the healthiest, the best way that mamas make more milk, the babies are happy, and that's what we prefer. In a cold rain, I do have to um, offer them shelter, but there is not shelter on every one of our pastures, and I don't think you need it on yours either, unless maybe you're in a brutal environment. Uh, I think that's all I want to say, Margo. Thanks. So now we're <laughs> We'll head back up to the land of snow. <laughs> Linda. Linda, your internet went out. If you're on the phone, join that way. Well, we'll I have this. this. I, 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 there you are. Have this um, goal. I, if, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. 
Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I, you're all frozen. So really what I was just what I was just saying was that I have a criteria for success. What I like to think about is if I disappeared tomorrow along with my fences and my hay pile and everything except my guard dogs and my sheep, could those animals go ahead and thrive when I was gone? And so it's really about putting nature first and coming up with animals that act almost like wildlife. And given that, you're probably going to be surprised to hear that that I treat every illness that happens with the best available medications. I have an arsenal of them. I work closely with a veterinarian. I intervene at the first real sign of problems with lambing and calving. And to me, one of those first signs is that water bag that um, was shown in Tracy slides of the goat, that nice, clear, kind of a whitish, opaque color. That's good when it's yellow. I don't wait for an hour. I get in there and and I see what's going on because that's a sign of of the fetal um, outputs uh, being messed up. The the lamb and the ewe are struggling. So I intervene early. I'll use commercial dewormers to treat any animal that shows need for it. Although I don't deworm the whole flock ever, and uh, I get away with this because every time I do one of those things, I write it down and every animal that I had to lay my hands on for that type of work, I call them. Uh, so only the kind of like do-it-yourself site adapted sheep get to stay on my place and reproduce. Margo, if you could go to the next slide. I don't know what you have up because I can't see it, but anyway. Me, now we're looking at your, your land and sheep cycle. Good, perfect. Yeah, the single most important thing to me to make um, lambing easier is closely matching my shepherding cycle to the rhythms of the lamb uh, of the land. And here it it was 113 in June, and we frequently have have snow in April. Um, I envy people like Margot and Linda Coffee who can lamb and and kid at different times of the year. I can't. I can lamb in May if I don't want to um, exacerbate problems. And so uh, there's the weather part of it. Here's another part, and that's what Linda Coffey showed with the cycle of nutritional needs of your animals. I can count on green grass two months out of the year, and that's May and June. We might get four or five months of green grass, but really I should only count on two. And so I want the heavy lactation to coincide with the time when I have the best available forage on pasture. And so you can do what I've done with your own place, the characteristics of your own land, map out when you have feed available, when you have shelter um, in the place where you need it. Um, you can put in there some of your own context, like when you want to be marketing your animals or you know, summer vacation, you need to be gone. You can put all that in too. And then on the other side, put in the needs of whatever type of livestock you're raising. Sheep have a five month gestation period. Um, I like to flush my ewes, give them uh, some improved nutrition for the about three weeks before I breed them. And so you can just take those two pieces of of here's, here's the cycle of the land in my context and here's the cycle of my livestock and kind of twist them back and forth until you see the best possible match. And what you'll find with that is that will save you time, it will save you money, it will save you headaches, you can increase your profitability, you can lower your risk, and you can just have so much better time um, with with your livestock operation. I had a short conversation with Temple Grandin a little while ago, and one of the things that she pointed out is that as we're doing this, whenever we're doing something that's a little new, or in the context that we are now, the world is changing around us so quickly, it's important to start with the easy successes. And to me, those easy successes, the, the place where you can start is to really carefully match your livestock to your land and to your goals and make sure that you pay attention to the, to the soil health principles so your land is healthy and these principles that we've given you for uh, 
for a successful birthing season. And I'm always happy to talk with people about this. You can find me almost all the time on the Soil for Water forum or just contact me by email. So thank you. We also are in Montana, but we're in a little bit different situation than Linda. As I mentioned, we're on the warmer western side of Montana. So we time our lambing for uh, early April. We've shifted from the 1st of April to about the 15th in an attempt to avoid snow on the lambs. And that seems to be working well for us. We formerly brought in all the lambs as soon as they were born and jugged them up with their mothers. But uh, over the years that we've been doing this, we just realized that that wasn't really necessary for us. So we now, leave them on pasture unless they need an intervention. And for us, that's um, multiples. <laughs> um, if we have triplets or quads, like in this picture, we, we do bring those in. Um, often I find that sheep have trouble with the higher math of counting to three. And so if they have, if they have triplets, they may need to be together for a while to get used to the fact that they have three. And um, if, if we do have triplets, we watch them really carefully because it is frequently the situation that the mother does not have enough milk for them and we will need to bottle one of those triplets. Now that depends again on the, the condition of the pasture, that depends on the breed of sheep you have. Um, some, some can do three or four just fine and, and without problems, but it's worth, it's worth upping your observation of those multiple births. Uh, over time, we have, have looked for sheep that that matched our, our place and our situation and ones who are good mothers on pasture, we rotationally graze. So they're moving um, field to field every day. Um, for, for a while, we kept them in a, a hard-sided fence while they were lambing and as the lambs were young, but now we've learned over time that they can do just fine lambing in an electro net enclosure and moving right along. And so that that is what we do. Our cattle, uh, have on pasture and are right out there. We do not enclose them at all. Um, they just keep up with the, the rest of the herd and rotate along. And, and that is what we do. Um, because we have hair sheep, we don't have to dock their tail and we do um, minimal interventions. We put on, we castrate and do um, ear tagging uh, within the first 10 days, but not right at the beginning. And that is a situation that, that has worked well for us over time. That's all I need to say. Thanks, so this is Margo and I am in Arkansas. And um, you know we, we are a pasture-based uh, system and um, on our farm, uh, some of our, our main goals is that everything is very low input and hands-off and um, we want our animals and our systems to uh, require as little of our attention as, as possible. Um, that might sound harsh to some, but that's, that's what's important to us um, with a lot of other things going on. So um, we definitely, um, you know, only keep animals that are able to function in our system that are able to kid and calve, um, you know, with no assistance and raise their babies with, with very little assistance. Um, and so we do pay close attention to, to that and, and record keeping. Um, I will say we, you know, in all of uh, my years of, of raising animals on my own, um, we have had to intervene very, very few times. Um, you know, I think it goes back to those keys to success of having um, animals that do well in our system um, on a good plan of nutrition and, um, you know, letting them do what they know how to do. Um, we like to calve in the fall. Um, and that's um, for a lot of reasons. I know, you know, everybody has different reasons of whether they like to calve in the spring or the fall, but um, we calve in the fall. Um, and, um, you know, really our, <laughs> our cows, I very rarely even see one be born. Um, they, they do their thing. And, um, and we've been really happy with our, our belted Galloways and raising um, really hardy calves, having lots of good milk. Um, really good mamas. And so we, we really have had no problems with them. Um, our goats, as I mentioned earlier, we typically kid in about February. 
and um, Arkansas weather, I think like lots of places, but here um, it's quite variable. Um, some, some days it's, you know, really nice temperate 50, 60 degrees in February. And then, like I said earlier last year, it was negative 20 um, and we had goats being born. So um, it, it's kind of hit and miss what kind of <laughs> what kind of weather we have, um, but we do try to uh, control our breeding season with with both our, our cows and our goats, um, so that we um, know when to expect animals and we can kind of manage our systems better. But but really overall, um, it's it's knowing our animals and um, knowing that they fit our system and that they are able to function really well. Um, you know, in our system. System, which is very low input. So as we wrap things up, we really appreciate everyone sticking around and we're going to get to some questions. Um, but really the encouragement is, is these animals, they know what to do for the most part. Um, and, and so I think it's really important to to let our animals be animals. Um, and as, as Tracy mentioned earlier, like we need to know when we should intervene, but um, to be, uh, you know, use that really judici ju judiciously. Um, knowing your livestock, knowing their behaviors. Um, I think this is really important, knowing uh, the normal behavior so you can tell when one of them's off and that can, you know, help uh, address nutrition problems and health problems. And obviously as we approach birthing, um, and know that most of the time they don't need us, um, but to do be prepared in case they do need us um, and, and do know that we are here to help and help um, answer questions and as you navigate um, breeding and, and birthing with your livestock. So there will be resources sent tomorrow or maybe later today, Larissa mentioned. Um, uh, we put together a lot of really good information of our ATRA resources, um, some livestock production workshops that we've done earlier. Um, here are all of our emails and the, the, uh, will also be on the resource list. And as we've said several times, visit the ATRA website um, for more um, resources on all areas of livestock and pasture management. And with that, I think we're going to open it up for um, questions. And um, I guess all the NCAP folks, we can come off chat. I have not been watching chat. So uh, Linda or Tracy, um, Margo, that's me. Um, if you have questions specifically for any of us, you can put them in the chat. Or Tracy and Linda, I'm not sure if you've been watching chat and have some things we want to make sure and address. So Margo, this is Samantha here. Um, there are quite a few questions in the Q&A and thank you so much to Linda and Tracy for answering them. Um, and uh, as, we, as they've been going along, because there's quite a few of them. But Great. if you, um, so just be aware, not just the chat, but also look in the Q&A. Okay, thank you. And I apologize, I could not keep up. Um, There's some great questions in there. Uh, I have been telling several of you email us because I'm afraid we're not going to get to everyone's question and, and but we want to help. So uh, if you've got a question that we can't address today, please, please do email one of us and, and we'll get right back to you as, as fast as we can. And um, while the, um, yeah, while I'm giving the presenters well, thank you very much, by the way, for that awesome presentation, um, a chance to kind of scroll down the various places. I'm going to run a quick poll for those of you that are still on, um, just to give us some feedback about this presentation so far. So hold on one moment, please. Okay, so you should see um, five questions, quick ones. If you could give us your responses, that would be awesome for future planning. So I'll give folks a minute or two. I also want to say those resources we send tomorrow are going to be helpful for some of your questions, and um, we'd be happy to direct you to exactly where those are if you uh, reach out to us after you get that list with whatever questions you still have that we can't address. Um, we're happy to help with that. All right, so while folks are taking the poll, um, and I apologize, I I due to the way we were sharing screens, I wasn't able to keep up on the chat or the Q&A either. So I haven't really had a chance to read through st such um, what's been coming in. But were there any themes? Um, I, I, 
Well, I do see a couple of questions here. Um, a, a few about, you know, how cold is too cold and how warm do animals um, need to be? And, um, you know, Tracy and Linda Poole, I'd love to hear your answer. Um, you know, <laughs> since you, you are in colder environments, um, I will say, um, you know, part of this goes to your animals and what they're used to in your environment. And so, as I mentioned, you know, uh, negative 20 is our animals, I, I as a human had never experienced <laughs> that before. And so we, you know, that was a different situation than our typical um, kidding season. But, you know, negative 20 for Linda Poole is a, a very common occurrence. So I, I'd be curious um, to hear everyone's answers of what, what temperature um, do you intervene? You know, I think one of the best ways to intervene is with good nutrition, because if those mothers have the right nutrition, um, those lambs are born with plenty of brown fat, and that's really helpful. Um, I can't get away from the weather. It can snow anytime here. And so starting with the best month that I can is one piece. But, you know, if you go on the, if you go on the internet, there are, there's specific protocol for warming up cold lambs. And you do not want to warm them up without some type of glucose in their system if they're over a certain age because they're brown fat. Anyway, can't go into it. It's too much detail at this point. But if, if you're in a situation where, you've, where you think you're looking at cold weather, do some of that research ahead of time and figure out how to, how to deal with it. Another thing that we do, because I raise wool sheep and I have to shear them um, because I love wool, you know clearly I love wool, um, is uh, I shear about a month before lambing. And that way those ewes are, uh, you know, they're, sorry, big dog right now. Um, uh, you know, the, those ewes are going to be um, careful about their lambs. And, uh, and that's kind of helpful too. What do you, what do you think, Tracy? I think it, it depends, my favorite answer. <laughs> Um, cold rain on a lamb at 32 can be worse than snow at 10. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it depends on, on the situation of, of how humid it is, how wet it is, how new the lamb is, um, or calf. Um, we had a calf the other day, it was zero. The calf was born in the pasture, the calf is fine. <laughs> and so it, you, maybe I would say you have to really up your observation skills if it's cold, if it's anywhere below freezing, you need to really be watching them and make sure that they bond right away and that they're getting milk into them right away. Now, that said, um, once you're dropping down to zero or below, you're really in danger of, of frostbite and, and issues like that. So that's a, a whole different issue from, from are, they, are they getting enough milk in? Um, so yeah, at that point, you're going to really need to intervene. But if you're, if you're dropping to temperatures that low, change your birthing time. <laughs> I mean, adjust <laughs> your schedule and, and make, it, make an adaptation that way. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of curious about Margo and Linda Coffee on this because I find it harder to save lambs that get dehydrated and too hot. Oh, I think she's stuck again. Our, well, our animals are really, <laughs> really used to hot and humid. So um, that, that has not been um, was, an issue, an issue for us. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that too. Our, our animals are acclimated to hot, humid times. And as far cold, I mean, Marvin and I were talking about Arkansas is a mild climate, but it's an unpredictable climate. So we can go, we can do a 40, 40 degree swing in a day, we can go from a lovely sunny day to a cold rain wind. And so um, I find that on dry, in dry weather, our animals do better when they're lambing or kidding. I, I don't like to deal with a lot of mud and I don't, I really don't like to deal with that cold rain, so. Yeah, and as I think it was Linda Poole who mentioned earlier, if, if those babies have some milk in them, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if they're nursing and they're up, it's kind of those observation skills. If they're up and they're nursing, um, then I, I don't, you know, I don't worry about it too much. 
you know, we didn't talk about Tracy, or if you did, I missed it because I was trying to answer a question. Do you pick up your babies and like feel how heavy they are in the midsection to kind of tell, yes, they've got plenty of milk? Or you just look at behavior or stance? Um, I'm a big fan of mouth temperature. Um, yeah, feel, their, yeah. feel their lips and see if they're warm, feel their tongue and see if it's warm. If it's, if it's cool, they're not getting enough milk, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, other than that, I just look at their happy stance. If they're hanging with their head down, they're, they're not doing well. Um, mm -hmm. and just look at their behavior. Yeah. And this is something we continue to look at as we turn them out, as we are feeding, like I said, that's a key time to watch our animals, watch the mothers eat, watch the babies play. And if somebody doesn't feel like playing and they're standing hunched over, we, we have to check out. Uh, I need a better system for seeing whose mama it is. Like, do you paint brand to match your mamas with your babies? No. No, we have spotted dotted sheep and multicolored, so it's easier for us because we can. Uh, we can oh, just remember. remember. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say my daughters are amazing at remembering who belongs with who and um, another really great record keeping tool that we all have is to take a picture. Mm -hmm. So I oftentimes just when I come upon, you know, a mom with babies, I just snap a picture for nothing else other than like, okay, I, I know you know, she had these two babies. This is maybe kind of what they look like. <laughs> Our goats tend to be mostly white. So it does get a little confusing sometimes. Um, but, you know, that's a, a, a good tool to, we definitely have had that confusion. Um, they all get together and then sorting out who belongs with who. But um, I definitely have referred back to pictures and ask my daughters to help me <laughs> sort out who's who. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I know that there are tons of questions still, and I'm thinking maybe if you all are up for it, maybe uh, we we could um, sometime in the, the future do some kind of more Q&A format, um, you know, and have people watch this kind of as a precursor and then get back together for, for you know, getting into some of these questions a little bit more depth. Obviously, there's some opportunities for follow-up as well. Um, let me click through to the next slide because I think this, oh, that that was the slide that had um, the ATRA website, but we'll be sending out everyone's email address as well. Um, so I apologize to everyone that uh, might be <laughs> still looking for some answers. There's a lot, there's a lot to consider. And like I said, I will be sending out um, a link to the slides themselves, the video, and this awesome, amazing resource list um, that's posted right now on our website as well um, in the next couple hours. So keep an eye out for that stuff in your in your inbox. Um, just a few housekeeping items uh, before we sign off. Um, a quick plug for some other stuff we have coming up this, this winter. Uh, we are going to continue this birth birthing on, on pasture series next week, um, talking more about farrowing. So if folks have um, interest in that topic, please join us. And then several more coming up later this month into February, we're going to be scheduling some more for um, the, the coming months. Uh, but the big thing I want to call to everyone's attention is that our Fund the Farmer grant applications are due next week. So take a, um, a look at that if that's something you're considering. Try to get your application in ahead of time. It's always better to do it a little early in case you come across any issues. Um, but I will be sending out links to, to all those things in the follow-up email as well. So um, I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Uh, a real sincere thank you to all of our panelists. You are wonderful. It's been such a pleasure to work with you on this. Um, it was really top notch. That's a great practical advice. And um, it was also fun. It's fun to have a great panel um, on our screen. So thank you very much. And everyone out in the audience, thank you for being here um, and for your interest in this topic and really doing your best on behalf of, of, of your animals and your community and your land. So we, we appreciate everything that you're doing. And I hope that um, you had a good experience today, took, got some, some, some really good stuff to take away and use and that we're, we're able to connect again soon. So thanks everyone. And um, we'll sign off. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, bye. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye. You. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you.